Nou, welkom terug na de koffiebreek. Ik hoop dat jullie... Uh, oh, well, I'll switch to English because the next talk is in English as well. I hope you had your caffeine shot. And uh, next up is uh, Victor van der Veen. He is a PhD student at the uh, Vrije Universite Universiteit Amsterdam in the System and Network Security Group. And he's going to talk about two-factor authentication on your smartphone. If you're using your smartphone for your, for your work and your two-factor authentication, what could go wrong? Victor, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm uh, Victor van der Veen, um, and I'm going to talk about how Google actually killed your two-factor authentication. And I have to say that most of this work was done by Radesh. He should be in the room by now, somewhere. Um, try to, if you want to talk about this, try to also uh, contact him later today. Um, so about me, I'm uh, Victor van der Veen. I'm a PhD student since 2014. And I've been working on uh, a couple of things. Um, first couple of stuff I did was about analysis, malware analysis. So I looked at Android in specific. And I worked on the Androbis platform and Tracerwork platform to do automated analysis of uh, Android applications. Uh, then I also worked a little bit on binary hardening, so protecting your binaries against uh, control flow hijacking attacks. Uh, which resulted in two projects, Pot Armor and Type Armor. And today I'm going to talk about exploitation. Um, but also, hopefully later this year, there will be another interesting uh, project coming up. Uh, so I'm at Freie Universiteit. We are System and Network Security, so the System and Network Security Group. Uh, but we renamed ourselves to FUSEC. And basically we do research on system level security and reliability. Uh, so aside from the uh, topics I worked on before, we also do dependable system research, software testing, side channels, and reverse engineering. Uh, in short, we do cool stuff. And if you want to know more about our group, um, we recently launched a new website, fusec.net. We're still working on it. I don't think I have a people page there yet. Um, but um, if you want to know more about the group, have a look there. So today we are at the Black Hat sessions. And we're going to talk about mobile insecurity. Um, this is the parallel track uh, technies, but not really. It's only a little bit technies. Uh, because Google made it very easy for us, also Apple, actually. Um, however, there will be still plenty of room for discussion. So let's look at why Google made it easy. Um, we have to look at anywhere computing. And and we're computing, what it means in, in this scope is that vendors have been closing the gap between the PC platform and the mobile platform. And uh, examples include installing apps from your browser. So with Google Play, you can browse to the Play Store on your uh, desktop PC and say, install this app, push it to my mobile phone. Um, also, what we see happening is that browser data is being synchronized more and more. For example, bookmarks. Uh, the tabs that you have opened, your history, uh, etc. And also, uh, of course, personal data. So you can open your mail on your desktop, work on the mail or a document, and then move to your laptop or your tablet, continue working on the same uh, document. Also, in some severe cases, you see that SMS these days uh, is being synchronized between the mobile uh, device and the actual desktop. However, these so-called usability features, which everybody is using, including myself, they come with a price. Because it seems that if you can compromise one device, then, for example, you can use this feature from Google or Apple or Microsoft uh, to install an app, a malicious app, uh, to your mobile device and just compromise all your devices. And this is where we introduce Bandroid, so the browser to Android vulnerability. It's basically a very easy two-step exploitation model. First, you get Google authentication cookies or credentials, which you can buy online if you want, or maybe you find another way to get onto the desktop. And then you use the feature from Google to install uh, a malicious app onto the victim's phone and take over control. So the threat model that we're working on is a compromised browser, or in other words, a man in a browser. Now the question is, is this a fair assumption? Because isn't it the case that once your credentials are lost, it's game over anyway? 
And for that, we have to look at two-factor authentication. Um, so two-factor authentication is a form of multi-factor authentication. has been around for quite some time already. And um, the idea is that you use multiple components to identify yourself. Uh, in the ideal world, you have three, something you know, uh, something you possess, so the bank card or uh, a bank reader, card, card reader, or, uh, and something you are. And uh, multi-factor authentication relies on the separation of the components. So even an attacker wants to take over control, he has to control all the components and not just one. So let's look at an example. First generation e-banking. You have a me and I have my bank here. And uh, this is very simple. Um, I'm trying to log in, so username, password. And I'm going to say, let's transfer 100 euros to account number X. And the bank happily agrees and does so for me. So of course, this is uh, unsafe. And I doubt that it was ever uh, being used like this. Because if you have the man in the browser, if your browser is infected, then the attacker can simply capture your credentials and then attack later. Um, next week, next month, whatever he thinks uh, he wants to attack you. So we're not happy. Now let's look at SMS-based two-factor authentication, second gen. Uh, so you log in, here are my credentials. Please transfer 100 euros to account number X. Um, okay, says the bank, uh, but now I want to make sure that you are actually the person I'm communicating with, so I'm sending you a code uh, to your mobile phone. And now I have to enter this code into the website to actually confirm that uh, transaction. And the code here is called the one-time password. And um, this should stop attacks. However, criminals got smarter. So what they started doing is once you have the man in the browser, uh, you can attack in real time. Just when, so when the uh, transaction is actually uh, in place. Um, so instead of tra you saying to the bank, I want to transfer 100 euros, in the background, the attacker changed that, let's make that uh, almost 1,000 euros to my own account number. So again, we're not happy. So we got to the third generation, which is, I think, now uh, in place. At most, most financial institutions that use this uh, way of two-factor authentication. Um, we again have the bank, we log in. I want to transfer the money. And now the code that is being sent to the, uh, to the mobile phone of the user includes the transaction details. So it says this one-time password is valid to transfer 100 euros to account number X. So if the attacker changes this, the user will see it on his mobile phone. And he can call his bank to say something fishy is going on. Uh, and in this example, the operation of uh, transferring the 100 euros is protected by, successfully protected by two-factor authentication. Now, to come back at the question I asked before, once your credentials are lost, is it really game over anyway? So in this situation, no, because the banks came up with a smart idea of saying, uh, of including the details, and you can actually detect, still do something uh, against the attack. And we're happy. So we started to see new attack variants, because if the smartphone is used to receive the, the SMS, the 10 code, or the one-time password, uh, then let's try to get a malicious app on that smartphone that will forward the one-time password to the, to the attacker. Uh, however, deploying the app is very hard, and current malware uh, relies on site loading and social engineering. Um, Basically, on Android, it works by uh, spamming the user with a link to an APK, uh, which the user then has to install. But for that, he has to enable the specific option to allow app installation from unknown sources. On, info on iPhone, it will only work if your device is actually uh, jailbroken. Um, examples of these malware are there. So it's associated in the mobile, or uh, SpyEye in the mobile, or Sitmo. Um, but to make it easier again, we have now Bandroid that we can use. So, e-banking with Bandroid. We have the man in the browser. Um, from the browser, we can now infect the phone with a malicious app 
and we get a man in the mobile also. And now it's easy. You can capture the credentials at some point in time and then attack later again. Um, the attacker will say, hey, these are the, these are the credentials of the victim. Um, please transfer this amount of money to my own account. And then the SMS will come to the victim's phone. But since it's affected with a malicious app, it will be forwarded to the attacker, and the attacker can use it um, to confirm the transaction. Not so happy anymore. So what did we do uh, once we found this? So Redes came up with, 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 the, with the idea of doing this. Uh, we worked a little bit on a concept, a proof of concept, and we contacted Google about the issue in February 2015. So it's over a year ago. And the reply was, after some exchange of email, the reply was, we believe that there are sufficient security barriers in place to make it difficult enough for an attacker. And they actually included the security barriers. So I'm now going to go over them. Um, first thing they said is, yeah, but a victim's PC or browser must be compromised. So all right, this is actually the threat model that we're working on. It's 2FA, uh, saying even if one component is compromised, like the victim's browser, um, the 2FA protected operations should remain secure. Um, for example, completing the financial transaction. Now, if you look at recent history, enabling two-factor authentication makes a lot of sense because you have a lot of malware that's actually doing a lot of damage these days. Second point, second security barrier that was supposed to be in place, um, according to Google, is that an attacker must upload a malicious app to the Play Store. In other words, if you want to do this attack, you have to bypass Bouncer, which is the, uh, the protection mechanism of the Play Store to remove malicious apps from it. Um, it has been shown before already that this is relatively easy to do. Um, our approach, so we, we, we did it actually, uh, our approach was to publish a vulnerable application, a vulnerable SMS-based backup application, um, that whenever an SMS would come in to the phone, it would be processed by the app, and then it would load a remote web page in the background, and then the, the page would expose a process builder which we could use to actually execute commands on the phone and just get the, the contents of the SMS message. We had this app in the App Store for months. I will um, talk in a minute, a minute about how it got removed. Uh, so, but it's easy to bypass Bouncer. Three is the victim must avoid notice, noticing that the malicious app was uploaded to play. So you probably meant phone here. Um, so we have to do, as an attacker, we have to think about, can we hide our application? Can we, once it is installed, can we, can we avoid the user detecting the installation of such malicious app? So we do three, two or three things. Um, the first thing you see if you use the remote install feature from Google is a notification in the top of your screen saying app blah blah is installed. That's the only thing you see. Um, what we do in our uh, proof of concept is something we named app name masquerading. And uh, what it means is that usually you have um, the app blah blah is installed notification in the notification area. Um, and then in the launcher where you have all your apps, you would see the same app name appearing. And then if you go to the app overview settings, you again would see the same app name. However, using uh, the Google uh, programming capabilities that they provide, um, you can change this. So you can make sure that in the, no the notification, the app name that's listed in the notification area actually differs, differs from the app name that you see in the launcher, which is again different from the app name that you see in the overview settings. And in addition, once the app is started, an app can remove its own launcher icon. So once the app is, is started, you won't see it anymore, except for the app overview uh, setting screen. Fourth point was that the victim must either manually activate the app or click a link that activates the app. 
Um, so this is app activation. So by default, um, if you install an app on your phone, it's inactive and it doesn't do anything. So you cannot uh, receive SMS messages with it by just simply installing it. So um, what you need to do is to, uh, in order to activate an app, you need to have one user interaction uh, to trigger the activation. And basically, a click on a custom URI is enough to activate the application. So what you can do is an attacker, you can send an email because you already have the, uh, the credentials of the user because you are in the browser. So you can see send an email to the user itself as it's coming from itself with a link and hoping the user clicks on it. Uh, or you can replace URLs in the, in the Google Documents um, so that whenever the user starts working on its own document, clicks on a link and gets the app uh, activated. Uh, or what we will show is you can replace the browser's recent tabs. Because you're in the browser, it will get synchronized with the phone. Um, and once you then, as a victim, open the, uh, your recent tab or your history or your bookmark, um, it, will actually, it will actually activate the app. Um, in other words, I'm a user. Let me show you this awesome TV series. I have a bookmark here. Click, and the app is active and can do its malicious work. Uh, or what you can do is exploit the user's curiosity. So instead of doing all these difficult tricks, just hope that the user will click on the app because it has a nice name, interesting name, maybe it's the game, or maybe the icon is really attractive and trigger the user uh, to open the app. Uh, the fifth point Google made was that the victim must be using an SMS-based two-factor authentication mechanism for the bank, and not an app or a hardware-based mechanism, hardware, hardware token-based mechanism. Um, so what they're saying here is that SMS-based two-factor authentication is basically obsolete. However, there are quite a number of companies that are still using SMS-based two-factor authentication, or at least offering you to use it. Uh, this includes Google, and uh, themselves, but also LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, PayPal, GitHub, WordPress, Kickstarter, a lot. Moreover, um, if you want to use an app, so for example, the Google Authenticator, or Microsoft also has their Azure Authenticator, I believe, um, you can most often trigger it to fall back to use SMS. Um, because what if your smartphone breaks down and you can no longer access the application? There must be a way then to still use the SMS, uh, to still get a two-factor token. Um, and if the phone number that the victim uses for the SMS is actually the same phone that he uses to get uh, the authenticator, you can very easily bypass this. And then finally, Google was saying, um, even if you manage to do all of this, which is very easy, um, even then the victim will still immediately see the SMS with the one-time password, and he can contact the bank. So can we uh, hide the SMS as a criminal? Um, so I'm not sure if this is really accurate still, um, but many users are still on an older version of Android uh, for which an app can actually remove the SMS from the inbox. But even if you cannot do that anymore in the recent Android phones. Um, the question is, how attentive are you? If you receive a one-time password from your bank um, at four in the morning, do you wake up? And if you wake up, if you see it, would you contact your bank? Um, or would you think, nah, I'm going to wait. It's probably nothing. And a short time window here for the attacker is probably enough, because you can fully automate the attack and by the time you wake up and actually log in again to see your, uh, your banking statement, the demo is already done. All right, so in summary, I'm going to show the demo next. Summary of the attack is that um, the, the criminal has your control of your browser. It will request a remote app install uh, to the Google Play. Google Play will install our application. And then we use synchronization between desktop and the, and the mobile phone of the user to synchronize, uh, in our example, uh, bookmarks. 
And then once the user clicks on the bookmarks, we will trigger the activation. All right, so this is going to be the demo, demo video. Uh, on the right side, we're going to see uh, a malicious Chrome plugin that is representing the, the, uh, the malicious browser, uh, the, the compromised browser, the manager browser. And um, it already captured the Google credentials. Uh, in the background, it will replace the bookmarks. And it will trigger the remote app install. Uh, on the left side, we have the victim's phone. Where we're going to see the app install. We're going to see app hiding and name masquerading. And also, we will see the bookmark redirect trick to uh, get the app activated. And we're going to use this to bypass Google Authenticator by using the SMS fallback option. All right, so I'm browsing to Google, which will trigger the app install. Then in the top corner, you will see a notification downloading the app, installing the app, and that's it. So I now have the uh, notification area open. I see that there is an app installed named MiApp2. And I will swipe the notification away just to uh, move on with the, with the demo. So it's gone now. And you will see that here in the launcher, uh, there's this icon, the G, G Backup, which is actually the malicious app that we just installed with a different name and different icon also than what we saw in the, in the notification area. Um, I will close the launcher and then I will go to the app overview settings where we have a new app installed. Uh, and this time it's named G Surface. We saw the same malicious application from, our, from, from the Play Store. And we see here that the, the button on the top left for stop is grayed out. So this means that right now the app is not running. It's not active. It cannot intercept any SMS message. OK. Um, so now I'm going to open the browser on the phone. And I'm going to open one of the bookmarks. I actually only have one for the example. And it's a link to Mr. Robot on Wikipedia. So I'm opening the link. And you can see already that um, this is not Wikipedia. This is actually my own domain where I'm hosting the JavaScript, uh, the, the, the same page, the Wikipedia page, but with some injected JavaScript. I'm going to wait a bit. All right, so now the page is fully loaded. And um, still the app is not active because they built in this additional security feature in Chrome, in this case, and that there needs to be one user interaction be before you can redirect uh, to your application. Um, so the JavaScript that is running now um, will detect any touch on the screen, any touch on the page. And if there is a touch, it will redirect the app or the page to our malicious app. The malicious app will immediately redirect back to the actual Wikipedia page. Uh, and meanwhile, we'll get activated. So you will see a little bit flashy behavior. There it is. And you're back now actually to the original Wikipedia page. But right now, the app is active. So I'm going to show that. I'm going to show in the launcher that right now the, the G backup uh, app that we had there first, the icon is gone. If you open the app overview settings, where we will see the G surface, we will now see that it's running because we can actually force stop it if we want. Um, so we think that maybe the more advanced users will maybe detect it. I'm not even sure if I would. Uh, but definitely, my parents are not going to see anything weird here. All right, so right now, I'm back on the browser. I'm now trying to log in as an attacker into Google. Um, I have the password already, of course, but I have two-factor authentication enabled. And um, I need to enter the verification code. But I'm, I'm a very smart PC user. I'm very security aware. So 
I set it up in such a way that I'm using the Google Authenticator app, uh, which I should now open and then get a six-digit code and enter it. However, there is this nice link here in the bottom that says try another way to sign in. And if you click on it, we get an option. Oh, yeah, uh, send a text message to my phone number. So the attacker can use this. He will click on the link. He will wait. He will see an SMS coming in on the phone in the left. There it is. And also, the attacker now, so our app got activated. And uh, I'll just close one. The app got activated. And it contacted our web server, which is, uh, which is malicious, of course. And um, this gives the, app, uh, the attacker a shell on the victim's device. And now you can use this to actually go to the location where the app stored the, uh, the one-time password, copy-paste it into Google, and successfully log in. All right. I also said that uh, Apple also made it fairly easy. Um, so can we break also two-factor authentication on iOS? Uh, we have two attacks. The first one is very similar to the one we just saw on Android. Um, it uses a private API to do something whenever an SMS comes in. And you can bypass the app vetting process, which is a bit stricter than Bouncer maybe, but not that much, by using existing uh, exploitation techniques like uh, S-Drop. Um, however, this is no longer possible as of the l one of the latest iOS versions because they disabled the, the uh, they disabled you from accessing the, the private API. Um, however, they came up with this new feature, which is called Continuity. And um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a feature that's combined iOS and Mac OS X. Um, and what it does is it, it does more things, but one of the things it does is um, it can synchronize SMS messages between your iPhone and your Mac. Um, so when an SMS message appears um, on your iPhone, when you get an SMS coming in, it will also show up on your Mac. And if you enable this feature, um, they're automatically forward, um, but they're stored unencrypted uh, in a database, and they're readable by, for example, a Firefox plugin. So in this case, two-factor authentication is basically one-factor authentication, and uh, the attack also works. Um, so we have some recommendations. Um, we think that Google should require on-phone confirmation whenever you have used the remote install feature. And also we think that the uh, app, activating an app by clicking simply on, simply on a link um, should not be allowed. And also the, the trick that we use to hide our app um, seem a little bit fishy. I'm not sure if it's really that necessary to have those options. Um, for Apple, one, uh, to stop the continuity attack, one way to think of as a solution is to only forward text messages that are coming in from known contacts. Uh, and also maybe look at sandboxing uh, for the browser so that you cannot easily read the contents of the encrypted, the non-encrypted file with the SMS messages. Uh, for financial organi organization, we think that um, ideally, of course, they're going to switch away, a move away from uh, one-time passwords sent to your phone. Um, however, this is probably not very feasible. But we think that they should put pressure on vendors to actually fix this, um, and also try to educate users. Although it might might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, for end users, um, use a dumb phone, not a smartphone, uh, for your backup phone number if you use uh, the Google Authenticator. Or if you're at ING, um, use an old Nokia that cannot be affected with a malicious app to receive the 10 codes. Um, if you want to be sure that you cannot be affected by uh, once you have a man in the browser by malicious apps on your phones, you should think about maybe disabling the entire synchronization features that uh, Apple provides. So have a separate profile. Wherever 
then you can no longer read your email on your phone anymore, which is, of course, also not very convenient. Uh, so in conclusion, I think I have more time, so I will go, well, I hope to go a bit more. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we think that users have a, right now a false sense of security, and we think that the future of mobile phones to factor allocation is doomed, uh, although it's still widely used all over the world by many financial institutions. So the question is, who is responsible? Who is going to fix this? Uh, also, anywhere computing, the usability features that are coming up, very cool and everything, but they jeopardize some security guarantees. And the attacks that you can do with this are not limited to two-factor authentication. You can think about cross-platform exploitation. However, it's very hard to convince vendors about the severity of this. Um, so that's the, that's the technical part. I want to go quickly over the, uh, over the timeline um, in how we try to respond, how to try to get the uh, publicity for this and get it fixed. Um, so how much time do we have? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Um, so we started in February 2015, sent a mail to Google, and they were saying, yeah, it's mitigated in two ways. Uh, you have Bouncer, all right, and you have the app activation. At that time, we didn't know about two. Um, we were involved in the Malpair project. We also showed them a demo uh, in February 2015. Um, it involves the, the, the major Dutch banks. Uh, Redesk gave a demonstration, and e ING was actually not very happy about this. Um, we wrote a paper about this. We sent it to Google, and um, they replied. First one, first of one of the first replies was, okay, uh, so the, the ability to launch an inactive app from the browser via an intent is not intentional. Uh, they opened the bug. And then later they replied with the six security barriers that are in place. Uh, we went to the NCSC, uh, sent them a copy also, got a response later saying this is not really within our responsible disclosure the policy. Uh, however, later in November, later last year, they visited us at the VU and um, semi-rectified, I guess, the, our findings. Uh, Redesk gave a demonstration about this, Redesk together with Herbert at the NCC conference. Then in June, we decided to go a bit more public, and there was an article in the Volkskrant, which was quickly copied uh, also uh, to Belgium, so we went international. Um, and then so a small story on how the media works. So we, on purpose, we did not release many details about the attack. Uh, I must say there was a video which was not very strong. Um, uh, however, um, we were slaughtered in the media. Uh, while nobody actually tried to contact us and ask about more, more information about the attack. So things we heard were, this is nothing new. Uh, it's done before and this is so oversold. Um, you will know where you will get ba past the uh, past bouncer. Um, or, yeah, just use a strong password and nothing will happen. Uh, and one of the articles that came out was from Computer World, uh, titled, uh, Pre uh, Preposterous Blah Blah About Big Android Leak. And the few re researchers and media raised FUD. Uh, I had to look up what FUD means, but fear, uncertainty, and doubt. In other words, we were guilty of fear mongering. And, um, this blog attracts uh, 200,000 visitors per month. So we, we invited the author to have a chat. He came over and we wrote another article uh, about the issue. It was still mildly negative, but he did get the, the key point because um, at some point there was a sentence, Google killed the added value of mobile phone to factor allocation, which we think is pretty big. Um, then we set up a web page with a frequently asked question and explaining why we think this is an issue, and um, actually answering all the comments we got from the media. And things settled down a little bit. Uh, then we got a reply from Google also, saying we had a lot of discussion, but we decided that it's working as intended, and we're not going to change it. So then it was September, when I gave the first uh, presentation about this. I was in Vienna, the Android Security Symposium, and this is a story on how you can get your Android developer account banned. 
So I was there, I was speaking on, on Friday, and uh, Nick Kralovic, who is the head of Android Platform Security, was also there. He was speaking on Thursday morning, I believe. Um, but he couldn't make it to my talk on Friday because he was flying out. Although he saw the title and he was very interested. Um, so I had lunch with him, a lot of other people, of course. And I showed him the video that I just showed you guys of our attack. Mm, yeah, that's, that's, he, found it, he found it very interesting. And he was mostly concerned about why you would still get an SMS message. All right. So what, we, what I did then is, or actually he asked, for, asked me to do it, I sent him the slides and I sent him my videos. Um, time passes, we go to dinner, and um, he came up to me and said, yeah, maybe, can we, can we have a minute? So I stepped outside and said, yeah, our guys, uh, our guys in Mountain View, they, they found your app and um, it's going to be moved, likely, but yeah. So, and in the end, it resulted in actually getting your developer account banned. And he was saying, yeah, it's nothing personal, it's just policy. Right. Well, it's good that this was actually not nothing personal because it was not my account, but it was Herbert's. So, but this is, this is how you stop attackers, not actually fix the issue, but just get the app out of the app store and act like nothing happened. Uh, then in February, we went to Barbados. Uh, we presented the final research paper of, uh, of our paper at the Financial Crypto Conference. We had a lot of discussion, both positive and negative, and still we found that it's very easy, uh, very difficult to explain the issue. And also an interesting note is that if it wasn't for Google, Radesh almost drowned uh, in Barbados, which is an interesting story. If he's here, he probably can tell you about it. Um, so my take, oh, this should not be very, very, yeah, it's very interesting. My take on Google's view is that um, Google sees this attack as out of scope. So basically, they're saying it is game over once you lost your credentials. However, the banks are not uh, working like that. Um, and Google wants to use two-factor authentication only to protect against things like password leaks. So if your password was leaked in the LinkedIn hack, if you would use two-factor authentication, you would still be protected. Uh, they don't consider the attack that we discussed uh, as a vulnerability. Um, however, this is not what the banks are doing, right? So the banks are actually trying to uh, to protect you even if your browser has been hijacked. And this sort of breaks it all. And we think it's, or I think it's, it's very unfortunately that they did not even provide an option to disable the feature to remotely install application. Because it would be very easy to build in. doesn't even have to be uh, uh, enabled by default. But it would be great if you can just still use uh, use Google and Android and everything and all the synchronization, but not have the remote install app as a feature. And then also in April, we got slashed at twice, which was actually a mistake, should have been once, but we got the uh, same article published twice. And that's it. So the FAQ, you can find it here, should be online. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them.